start recording. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is so great to see so many folks joining in this afternoon from what I can see so far uh, across the province, for sure, from one end to the other, and maybe even a few folks out of the pro outside of the province. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us on World Water Day, a significant day to be sure. My name is Petra Rowell, and in my regular job, I'm the Executive Director of the Athabasca Watershed Council. But today, I'm honored to be your host for the next two hours. And of course, we're here to talk about uh, groundwater, making the invisible visible, the theme of the 2022 World Water Day. I hope that you know already that this event has been organized by the Education and Outreach Committee of Alberta's 11 Watershed Planning and Advisory Councils, also known as WPACs. Uh, altogether, Alberta's 11 WPACs cover 95% of Alberta's land base. And we spend a fair bit of our time working with the government of Alberta's Water for Life strategy and working towards implementations of its three goals, including that Albertans will be assured their drinking water is safe. Albertans will be assured that the province's aquatic ecosystems are maintained and protected. And Albertans will be assured that water is managed effectively to support sustainable economic development. To achieve these goals, Alberta's 11 WPACs engage all sectors of society in a consensus-based adaptive management approach to watershed management. This includes a lot of convening and collaborating like we're doing today with many others, being engaged in watershed and land use policy and planning, undertaking monitoring and reporting and building knowledge through education and outreach. If you haven't already, I really encourage you to learn more about the watershed council that's in your area and you can do this simply by googling our name and going to our website for more information. Before we go any farther today we'd like to start by recognizing the traditional lands and territories and the many indigenous people and nations that span Alberta's watersheds. Uh, an interesting note that I learned from Leah with the North Saskatchewan is that Canada spans 11 treaty territories with five of these treaty territories occurring in Alberta. Treaty 6, 7, and 8 span most of the province with uh, two other treaties, uh, Treaty 10 and Treaty 4, just partially coming into the province. Alberta is also home to eight Métis settlements, primarily located in East Central and Northern Alberta. And the Métis Nation of Alberta recognizes six regions within Alberta. And there's a great map uh, that's put together by the Alberta Teachers Association that shows all of these, uh, these boundaries. Now, as much as the map shows boundaries and lines, and we here today talking about watersheds, which also are defined by lines, we respect that indigenous people and nations have their own ways of relating to the land and the water. Recognizing that we are all treaty people, Alberta's WPAC seek to fulfill the spirit and intent of these treaties through an ongoing process. And we are committed to building stronger relationships that respect the indigenous peoples of this place and strive to work together to care for the land, water, and all living things that call Alberta home. All right. With that, I'd like to ask Kendra if she could, oh, I'll stop sharing. And I will ask Kendra to share a message from uh, Minister Nixon, the Minister of Alberta Environment and Parks. Hi, I'm Jason Nixon, Alberta's Minister of Environment and Parks. In recognition of World Water Day, it is a pleasure to offer greetings to so many Albertans that work to protect this valuable resource every day. The theme of World Water Day 2022 focuses on groundwater. Groundwater is a vital resource in Alberta, supplying various domestic, municipal, agriculture, and industrial water needs. More than 600,000 rural Albertans depend on groundwater for drinking water. Groundwater plays an essential role in helping to maintain lake levels and river flows. To manage groundwater effectively and ensure the health of all Albertans, it is essential to understand the occurrences, movement, and quality, and to manage these resources effectively. To achieve our goals, we must all continue to work together proactively 
on strategies to improve knowledge and understanding of groundwater resources. Watershed planning and advisory councils have made significant contributions towards regional planning, water management frameworks, research programs, policy advice, and local stewardship projects. That's why Alberta will continue to work with watershed planning and advisory councils and other key stakeholders to address any water quality and quantity challenges facing Alberta today and into the future. Thank you and happy World Water Day. Great, thanks, Kendra. Hi, I'm Jason Nixon, Alberta's Miss. Sorry. <laughs> okay, just before we leave that slide, I, I do want to acknowledge that we have a number of other dignitaries with us today. Um, more are signing on, uh, so I might not have the complete list, but I would like to acknowledge that we have MPs Arnold Viersen. Uh, Peace River Westlock and Don Barlow of Foothills with us today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I believe we have some MLAs, uh, including MLA Leela Ahir of Chestermere Strathmore and Garth Roswell, Ro Ro Roswell Vermilion Lloyd Minister Wainwright. Um, I believe we have a number of representatives from several constituency offices, um, particularly in the South, it looks like. So thank you for um, the constituency offices of uh, Lethbridge, Livingston, McLeod, and Lethbridge East. I believe we have some uh, retired uh, MLAs here today as well, and, and probably several others that I've missed. And I don't want to forget, we also have a number of municipal councillors. So to all of our elected officials joining us today, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we certainly appreciate it and know that you're busy people. If I've missed you, please don't hesitate to use the chat function to uh, introduce yourselves to the rest of us. I wanna do just one last shout out. Uh, I believe we have uh, Nate instructor, Crystal Eggert and her class joining us from Nate today. Uh, welcome Nate students, yay. <laughs> um, and I know there's many other folks today and I wish we could take the time to introduce all of you, but um, that would take our whole two hours. Um, so now that our uh, officials have hopefully signed the chat room, uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves and your affiliation. And with that, I think we're going to try and launch a poll and find out just where a little bit more about all of you and where you're joining us from today. Um, so I'm not sure, Elisa, are you, can you launch a poll on where, which watershed people are joining us from today? Yep, the poll is launched. Okay. I can't see it, so I'll let you, uh, have it up for a few minutes and tell maybe you can tell me if it looks like people are filling it in. Yeah, it looks like people are filling in. That's great. Awesome. I hear that uh, with uh, Zoom polls, or you can only have 10 answer options. So I believe we've combined the battle with the North Saskatchewan. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. So some folks might be wondering, but there's 11 watershed councils, but we've got 10 options. But so I'm just going to share the results. Awesome. And it looks like we have uh, people joining us from a lot of all the different watersheds. And uh, so, yeah, welcome everybody. That's great. Awesome. So we, so we have folks from all 11 watersheds or all 10 watersheds. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's awesome. Good to know everybody. I know uh, a number of years ago, we, we ran a, a water literacy survey and, and folks weren't necessarily too sure about which watershed they lived in. So it's great today that folks know um, the watershed that they are in. Um, actually, you know, Lisa, we did well with that. Could we run the second uh, poll as well and just find out which sector folks represent today? Sure, the second poll should be launched. All right. It's always great to know that we have a good selection of folks. I believe we have some, uh, like I say, a lot of municipal staff, some provincial staff, um, lots of not nonprofit and conservation organizations. Um, hope, I'm hoping we've got some industry folks, um, some indigenous communities represented. 
it's always great to have a, that's what watershed councils are all about is, you know, having representatives from all throughout the province and all different sectors of society. That's what make what makes water management stronger in Alberta. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm just sharing the results now and, and you're right. All the different sectors are represented there too. Hey, so that's, awesome. that's awesome. Thanks everybody. And again, if you uh, couldn't do the polls or, or weren't fast enough, feel free to put your name and your affiliation in the chat box. Okay, well, let's get into today's topic. What is uh, World Water Day? Uh, started in 1993, World Water Day is an annual United Nations observance. It's held on March 22nd every year, and it, info it focuses on the importance of water. It's coordinated by the UN Water Committee and led by one or more UN Water members that has a related mandate. In particular, World Water Day celebrates water and raises awareness of the 2 billion people living without access to safe water. It is about taking action to tackle the global water crisis. And a core focus of World Water Day is to, is to support the achievement of the sustainable development goal number six, that is water and sanitation for all by 2030. The theme this year of World Water Day is groundwater making the invisible visible. Um, and the United Nations has put some text around the narrative of this year's theme. And I'm just gonna read it. So groundwater is invisible, but its impact is visible everywhere. Out of sight, under our feet, groundwater is a hidden treasure that enriches our lives. In the driest parts of the world, it may be the only water people have. Almost all of the liquid fresh water in the world is groundwater, supporting supplies, sanitation systems, farming, industry, and ecosystems. In many places, human activities overuse and pollute groundwater. In other places, we simply do not know how much water is down there. Groundwater will play a critical role in adapting to climate change. We need to work together to sustainably manage this precious resource. Groundwater may be out of sight, but it must not be out of mind. The United Nations also uh, provides this lovely graphic that sort of explains what groundwater is. So groundwater is water found underground in the spaces between the grains of sand, soil, and rocks. Groundwater can be stored in underground aquifers, usually made up of permeable sedimentary rocks. Rain and snow melt recharge the groundwater, and groundwater can come to the surface in springs or be accessed through wells. So you might be asking by now, why is this theme, groundwater, relevant to Alberta's 11 watershed councils? Well, more than 600,000 Albertans, mainly in rural Alberta, but some small towns and villages, rely on groundwater for their drinking water and their household use. Also, many ranchers rely on groundwater uh, for watering their livestock. And finally, many of our industries and agri other agriculture rely on groundwater sources. Groundwater can easily be overlooked, uh, unlike our rivers, lakes, and streams. It remains invisible to us. So to learn more about this important resource, We've asked three speakers to join us today to talk about groundwater and the theme for World Water Day, making the invisible visible. We're going to let each presenter go through their presentations and their PowerPoints. And then when they're all done, uh, we will put them together as a panel and ask them a number of questions that have been submitted uh, through the registration process. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Brian, Brian Smearden. Uh, Dr. Smearden is a research associate and instructor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. He works to discover and share the story of groundwater. I love that. Where it originated, how long its journey has been, and its experience along the flow path. Brian is also president of the Canadian chapter of the International Association of Hydrogeologists. So welcome, Brian. And I will stop sharing so that you can share. Great. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, 
Yeah, thanks for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, first off, we can see the slide well enough? Yes, yeah. Perfect. All right. Okay, well, I guess kicking this off as the, as the sort of first speaker, I wanted to provide, I guess, uh, well, it's perhaps my perspective, a hydrogeologist perspective. So this is uh, someone who's trained in groundwater science for quite some time and um, you know, done a fair bit of work in, the, in that area. Um, yeah, so let's just kind of jump right into it. <clears throat> so yeah, I guess I thought about what was my first encounter with groundwater? And I guess, you know, not coming from uh, an acreage or a farming community, uh, not growing up in a, with a well, I grew up in a city. My first encounter with groundwater was entirely academic and no surprise, I'm probably one of those 9% that put academia as where I'm, I'm still sitting. And I clearly remember being in um, a high school geography class. We were studying a proposed hazardous waste landfill site that was gonna be sort of near our area. And we were looking at all facets of it. You know, why was it going to be there? Uh, why did it have to be our backyard and not someone else's? And all the different sort of social, geographic, geological pieces that went into it. And this idea of groundwater protection was mentioned. And up until this point in my life, which was quite some time actually, I had just thought water came from the tap. I didn't think too much about it. It was, you know, come from, coming from lakes and rivers when, uh, when I was out camping and that kind of thing. But this idea of water being in the ground really kind of stuck with me and learning about, learning about it and figuring out, you know, what, what is it? What does it look like? What is this thing we call water table? Um, and throughout these couple of slides, you'll see a bunch of graphics a lot of these graphics are, are cross sections. So they basically slices through um, you know, parts of the earth landscape just to see what's underneath. And so this one that's in front of you now, you can see you know, kind of a river on the surface running through a bit of a forest, let's say, and then all the layers of, of geology and layers of the earth that are below that. And some of them are, are shaded blue and that's where groundwater is. It, it is everywhere. Um, so my, my journey began with that simple curiosity, I guess, uh, is in terms of what was groundwater. So sort of building on the concept of how this, this year's focus on uh, World Water Day resonates with me, I started to think about, well, you know, where, where have I come from and where am I going? And throughout, you know, years of study and research and work, I still come back to the fact that somehow groundwater is both still mystical, and I mean that in a very positive way, yet it's also very tangible. And so we often hear people speak about it being this hidden resource. But likewise, if you're at an acreage or on a farm or near a spring, um, it's a very tangible resource you can touch and, and work with and drink and consume and you know, help um, supply environmental flows. So I guess from that regard, you know, groundwater is something that's everywhere. And the image that's in front of you now is you know, maybe a little more on the technical side, but it's again kind of a, a slice through a section of the earth and it's a cross section basically showing a water cycle and we're very used to seeing you know water moving from the oceans up into the atmosphere down through precipitation through the creeks through the lakes all the parts of it that we can swim in and, and touch and feel and and be surrounded by but that deep sort of reservoir and the groundwater beneath our feet is is there as well and it's an important part of that water cycle and an image like this starts to show you how all these things tie together and it Water doesn't know the difference of where it is. It's in one place and then it's in another place and it moves from one place to another. So it's a continuous cycle. And that's something that uh, still seems mystical to me even years later and also quite tangible. So the other part about this year and the topic making this invisible visible is, is really getting to shine a light on it. And so, you know, as was, was part of Petra's introduction, it is the hidden resource and I think the um, you know, the community that's provided a lot of sort of the introductory text to describe it has, has done a brilliant job with that and in, in starting to identify what groundwater really is and, and shining a light on it. So with that in mind, you know, starting from the fact that it is a hidden resource for a lot of people, there's a challenge to perceive it, you know, what is it and, and giving it a definition and having a link to it, you know, that you can understand. And that's kind of the first step when then we have to look at understanding our risks or the risks associated with it. So something like depletion, something like pollution, uh, what could happen in the future as things start to change, those rates of recharge change in different climate and how does that look? And so 
There is a challenge, and I think we need to acknowledge that. It's not the easiest thing to visualize. But again, showing an image here on the left-hand side of this slide, you know, we can still see groundwater is everywhere, and it does come bubbling up to surface. Some wells people might know of that are flowing wells. You know, they're very easy to get water out of. Some are, are less so, and we have to pump the water out of them. But I think by working in, you know, not only on the problems that we work on as, as scientists, but working together and working across different disciplines, there's a real opportunity. And I think that's the biggest thing about this year in, in making the invisible visible, is that there's a real opportunity to reveal that importance that groundwater is everywhere and it is part of that water cycle. And that, you know, together we can start to pull back this curtain, kind of shine that light and make it visible for, for all the different communities that, uh, that are involved and for everyone really. The second question, I guess, is, is what, you know, what impact? So I've, I have worked in this field for some time. You know, what impact is, has the work that I've been involved with done to improve or change the relation to groundwater? Um, so initially, like a lot of scientists, it's really around generating knowledge. And I think, you know, for the first probably 10 or 15 years or so, really, I became interested in looking at time frames. How does water move through the earth? How long does that take? How long does it take to cycle from one part to the other? And then when it gets to a when it gets to a part where we have a lake or river, um, you know, studying that in a little more detail, because that's some place that we get to see. And, you know, all these different adventures and projects and uh, research experiences have, you know, have of course had useful incremental small contributions to science. And that's the way science works baby steps, we, we march away slowly and solve small problems and um, hopefully someday those can contribute to bigger problems. Solving bigger problems, not creating bigger problems. But I think more and more, um, and especially in the last probably five years or so, I've started to get more involved in mobilizing that knowledge. So generating it is one part for sure. And there's lots of great people that are involved in doing that. And likewise, there's lots of folks involved in mobilizing that information, mobilizing that knowledge. And so for me, um, it's now shifting to, to starting work, working with more groups to help increase awareness, just participating in events such as this one, or even just aligning some of the research questions that you know, communities and groups might have um, you know, back into that academic setting so we can learn more about it and maybe supply something that's, that's useful at an appropriate scale that helps, helps change or helps make an implementation. And that's really where I think you know, thinking about this relationship with groundwater and the kind of work that we're doing now, that I'm doing now, it's really helping others kind of, I use the word integrate on the slide, but it's you know, almost helping others discover groundwater and bring that into their story because they're working on a story to tell as well. And so, you know, I think more and more my role is to, is to, to sort of help be that guide and help provide some of that information, help provide some of that, uh, that sort of background. Now, a couple of examples I just sort of wanted to share. Um, one from a few years back where I had the pleasure to work with some folks on the Grimshaw gravel aquifer system. So this is just a photograph you can see looking down into the Peace River Valley, um, kind of standing up in the, in the highland area. And this would be basically sitting on top of this Grimshaw gravel aquifer system. And, you know, folks there know a lot about this, this system. They, they drink from it. They use it all the time. They're quite passionate about it. And I think the role that the, 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 techno folks like myself brought into it was to just sort of enrich that understanding. And we went through and, um, you know, sort of better characterize the geology that was there to learn more about it. And that helped explain along with a bunch of water sampling that we coordinated with the municipality there. Um, to really look at some of the variation, you know, why was water chemistry different on one road compared to the next township road? And by understanding this resource in kind of three dimensions, we could then help explain that. And, you know, that's sort of the science coming into it and, and providing that explanation. But then that group can carry it forward and start to, to develop, you know, source water protection plans and other things that are that are useful at that, that scale. <clears throat> Second one I want to mention is um, actually a project I'm working on right now with the University of Alberta um, and EPCOR and the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. Um, it's really to take a closer look at that North Saskatchewan River and a lot of the groundwater that's in the Edmonton area. And um, just really seeing what, you know, when we get down to those low, low flows in the drought years, you know, how much of that water, well, I mean, all of it is groundwater, but what does that look like feeding into these kinds of river systems? 
Now the, uh, the image, the sort of spidery image on the, uh, the lower right hand side is actually the, the gray shading is the city of Edmonton and then you've got Stony Plains Bruce Grove off to the west there to the left. And those sort of black lines draped through it are actually old sort of ancient river systems that have been you know, long covered by glacial deposits that are on, on Canada's landscape. But these have preserved a lot of you know, beautiful sand and gravel aquifer systems. Um, that are these channels sort of draped across the prairies. And we're taking a really close look at those in the Edmonton area, how they intersect the current river systems and how some communities are using those, using that groundwater and trying to bring that into the, into the story as well. Um, and then yes, maybe a brief shout out to, to Dave True, who I work with a little bit on finding out the role of groundwater in some of these uh, Parkland County lakes that are, that are scattered throughout the west side of, um, west part of the image shown here. So I'm not going to go through every uh, piece of, of information you see on the slide in front of you now, but I found this list that was produced by the uh, Stockholm International Water Institute. And um, this person, Jenny, has done a fantastic job just summarizing seven ways that you, you can make groundwater more visible. And I wanted to just highlight a couple of them. Um, so these are actually just a summary of, of what's on Jenny's original list. But it's the two on the left-hand side where I you know, find myself working most of the time. is It's that demystifying part explaining what is groundwater. You know, it is simply water in those rocks and pores, trying to help create better visualization, visualizations, trying to, to bring this into other people's story and accept that there's complexity and that's okay. We can understand some of that complexity, that it is a, a resource that involves a pore fluid. So fluid that's in the, in the rock or, or soil matrix, um, but it also moves around. And, and to some degree, both of those things need to be protected. Uh, I do encourage you to try to find this list and, and take a closer look at it, but I think that the seventh point that Jenny makes is that bottom one, which is the joining hands and working together. And I think certainly as we draw on things like highlighting biodiversity, talking about climate change, thinking about, you know, what the future could look like, that's where a lot of these pieces come together and certainly where groundwater can be made um, much more visible. So just, just some final thoughts to close out. Um, of course, as a researcher, you know, <laughs> I always see there's, there's more to explore. There's definitely more to analyze, um, more things to monitor. And I think that's where measurement and monitoring can come into the hands of the citizen scientists folks in the crowd, generating some information because it, that's what we need to help make decisions. And then really embracing that, that scale for impact we look at as often it's more localized. It's where you are, that watershed that you live in. And, and helping contribute to perhaps better management of it, or at least better understanding of it. And with that, I uh, thank you for the attention and the time so far and look forward to uh, the rest of this afternoon. Thank you, Brian. That was awesome. Um, you had lots of nice phrases in there that I'd like to explore more a little later on, you know, about shining a light, pulling back the curtain. Um, no boundaries is an interesting one too, because, you know, as I started with my, in my introduction, I mentioned the 11 watershed councils and, and how we sort of follow the watersheds of our major rivers. And that makes a challenge for us to think about groundwater because it doesn't follow those same boundaries. For me, the Athabasca watershed are the boundaries that I deal with. So we need to think differently about groundwater uh, within the 11 watershed councils even, so. So lots of interesting stuff in there. I also wanted to shout out, I'm glad you used that slide of the Grimshaw gravel aquifers. I just wanna point out to everybody and I, I hope we've got some folks from the Mighty Peace online, but um, uh, I believe the Grimshaw gravel aquifers group are, are the first ones to do a source protection plan for an aquifer in Alberta. And, and I think to date, it's still the only source protection plan for what is a major aquifer important for residents and agriculture and industry in the Grimshaw area. So great example to include. Okay, uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker, uh, and again, thank you, Brian. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Rita Wong, and you should be able to start sharing uh, while I read your introduction. Dr. Wong is an associate professor in critical and cultural studies at Emily Carr University. She investigates the relationships between contemporary poetics, water justice, and ecology. She has published many books and co-edited an anthology with Dorothy Christian 
entitled Downstream, Reimagining Water. She understands that when waterways are healthy, life, including people, will be healthy too. And that we cannot afford to endanger and pollute the waters that sustain our lives. That's, a, that's an awesome bio. Um, welcome, Rita. Look forward to hearing your, your talk. Oh. I can see your presentation. So. Oh, good. Thanks for the introduction, Petra, and thank you for that presentation, Brian. Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging that I'm coming today from uh, Coast Salish territories, the homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, this is a picture from a water ceremony in the Burrard Inlet with uh, one of the elders from the Tsleil-Waututh, Ta'a, um, who's been a big inspiration to me in terms of uh, really diving into my own relationship with water. So. Yeah, um, I was born on Treaty 7 territories, also known as Calgary, and I'll get into that in a, in a little bit. But I, I thought I would just acknowledge the lands that I'm on, because I've learned a great deal from the Coast Salish peoples where I'm living. So about a decade ago, uh, in 2012, we organized an event at Emory Carr um, University of Art and Design called Downstream Reimagining Water. And we brought together uh, people from all sorts of different walks of life. Um, like Brian was saying, it's so important to uh, be interdisciplinary and to work together on these um, questions of how to protect the water, which is also, of course, to protect ourselves. And uh, my friend Dorothy um, had organized an event with her friend Denise uh, a number of years ago um, called Protect Our Sacred Waters, which was to bring together people from all four directions uh, to, for the sake of water, that now is the time. Um, um, I believe that we're not just in a moment of climate change, but actually climate crisis. And uh, in a crisis, it's important not to panic. It's important to stay calm and work together to uh, figure out what you need to do. So, um, Paying attention to water is really, I think, crucial in how uh, I've navigated my response to climate crisis. So our bodies are roughly two thirds water. Um, and uh, that diagram of the hydrological cycle, I, I was taught that as a child. And I would like to think about ways to remember that we are part of the hydrological cycle. We're not separate from it. Um, when we look at that diagram, we're in it. <laughs> Our bodies uh, would just be dust and bones if we weren't part of the hydrological cycle. And so remembering that connection, I think, is so important. Um, and my work as an adult is to unlearn the disconnection and to um, remember that water doesn't need us, but we need water. And as Lee Miracle, um, a well-known writer who passed away in November, she's in the red jacket in the picture, Lee uh, told us basically that the water owns itself. Uh, that people don't own water. So it's a very different relationship in terms of thinking about um, uh, the water has its own spirit and force and energy. Um, and so to be humble about that and also to be grateful for the water and to be respectful for the water. I think those are baselines in terms of how to um, conduct ourselves in, in this time. And uh, that is something I have certainly learned from spending time uh, with uh, Lee, who's from the Stalo First Nation, as well as Dorothy, who's from Shipakmuk and Silk First Nations. Um, and just to really uh, honor that long-term um, history and knowledge that they have been so generous to share with folks like myself. Um, so I've been on this water journey for about a decade now. Um, and, uh, you know, um, just to situate Canada as a watershed, sorry, this slide is a little blurry, but when you look at it, you can see that the water flows basically to five large water bodies, the Pacific Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, Hudson's Bay, um, the Atlantic Ocean, and a teeny bit down uh, in the southern of, south of Alberta uh, to all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And so, Thinking about the flow of water um, scales down to the level of our tears, but also up to the level of the earth. Um, and taking a, a watershed lens uh, moves us towards what legal scholar Ardith Wacom and others would call a kin-centric view of the world. Uh, thinking about our relationships, our kin, um, 
and how we build better relationships than we might have inherited. Um, colonization has done a lot of damage to both people and land. And there's a lot of work now to heal both the people and the land. And um, I'm always mindful that I've inherited a colonial history I can't change or I didn't choose. But what I can choose is how I respond to that history by uh, moving forward with respect. Um, and um, that's why the acknowledgement is so important to me uh, to remember. So as I was saying, um, and shows like CBC's Eighth Fire suggest also that now is the time for people from all directions to work together for the well-being of the water, for the earth, and for ourselves. Um, and I just want to mention that as a writer, my work is with language. And the fact that I'm speaking to you in English right now, rather than in the Musqueam or Hunkaminam language, or in Blackfoot or in Cantonese, already offers a cultural filter that I need to be uh, conscious of and careful about. The Blackfoot scholar Leroy Little Bear has written that place acts like a repository of stories and experiences of both the individual and the tribe. In Blackfoot, the word for the English word story translates as involvement in an event. So in Blackfoot, it's the place telling the story. It's the place determining uh, who you are. And um, this reminds me of how in the Hunkaminam language in uh, where I'm living at the moment in on Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh territory and Squamish territory, um, verbs change form depending on where the, ver the speaker is situated. So if the water is, if the Fraser River is in front of you or behind you, if it's downstream or upstream, your verbs actually change. So the language itself is always conscious of where you are in relationship to the water. And the water is like built into the structure of the language, which is very, very different from English. Um, and so this sort of consciousness of the watershed is something that I think we need, uh, not just historically, but moving forward into the times that we're in. Uh, to remember, as I said, that we're part of the hydrological cycle um, and that uh, what happens to it happens to us. Um, so my own creative process as a writer uh, starts with listening and uh, following the water, basically paying attention to the water, acknowledging the water as a teacher itself. And what happens if we center our attention and our lives around the health of the water? what shifts in our consciousness and in our societies. So I'm gonna share a poem uh, called Declaration of Intent from my book of poetry, Undercurrent. Let the colonial borders be seen for the pretensions that they are. I hereby honor what the flow of water teaches us, the beauty of enough, the path of peace to be savored before the extremes of drought and flood overwhelm the careless. Water is a sacred bond embedded in our plump, moist cells, in our breaths that transpire to return to the clouds that gave us life through rain, in the rivers and aquifers that we and our neighbors drink, in the oceans that our foremothers came from. A watershed teaches not only humbleness, but climate fluency, the languages we need to interpret the sea's rising voice. Water connects us to salmon and cedar, whales and workers, its currents bearing the plastic from our fridges and closets. A gyre of karma recirculates, burgeoning body burden. I hereby invoke fluid wisdom to guide us through the toxic muck. I will apprentice myself to creeks and tributaries, groundwater and glaciers. Listen for the salty pulse within, the blood that recognizes marine ancestry. In its chemical composition and intuitive pull, I will learn through immersion, flotation, and transformation. As water expands and contracts, I will fit myself to its ever-changing dimensions. Molecular and spectacular, water will return what we give it, be that arrogance and poison, reverence and light, ambivalence and respect. Let our societies be revived as watersheds, as someone born in the Bow River watershed, uh, also known as Calgary, um, and my parents were born in the Pearl River watershed uh, in southern China, um, I needed to learn to listen to the whole earth as my home, uh, to respect both the places that I've lived as well as those that are far away. Um, and growing up on the traditional lands of the Sutina, Siksika, and Stony First Nations in Calgary, 
um, I was quite disconnected as a child growing up in that city. Um, it was only much uh, later, um, uh, actually when I was a student at the University of Calgary, that I, I came to realize that uh, my whole family and myself were drinking the Bull River and that we were part of that river system, whether or not we understood that before, we were still there. Um, as uh, Lee Marika would say, uh, when you're on Coast Salish territories, you still have a responsibility as a Coast Salish citizen, whether or not you understand that. And similarly, um, in um, Sutina, Siksika and Stony First Nations uh, territory, I think there's also a responsibility to care for these watersheds as well, uh, wherever we happen to find ourselves. And in his book, Watershed, uh, Reflections on Water, former Calgary mayor and Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, Grant McEwen, um, reminds us that 75% of the water uh, in the Bow and Elbow Rivers comes from snow melt. And if the amount of snow declines, so does our ability to live in this watershed. Um, so in the long term, we really need to pay attention to what's happening with both the glaciers and the groundwater, as I was saying in that poem. Um, so water connects us to places we know and love, like these beavers along the Bow River, as well as those we haven't seen, um, life that's far away from us, life that came long before us and will come after us as well. And when we start to visualize and materially track the flows of water that we're part of, we quickly realize how related we are to those we don't know and those we haven't seen. And so as it industriously chews on branches, these beavers are roughly two thirds water. Um, a pine tree we could think of as a slow vertical creek inside drawing water from its roots up to its alert needles. And you know, when we understand our body's watery matter as consisting of say the Pascapoo aquifer or the Bow River or the juicy salmon that we eat from the Fraser River, this offers us a way to see what we have in common with the watersheds that give us life. And I hope that it gives us energy and incentive to work together to protect these beautiful watersheds. Um, before he passed, uh, esteemed water scientist David Schindler taught us that all of the major rivers crossing the Western Prairie provinces originate in the Rocky Mountains, um, where deep snowpacks and melting glaciers maintain river and groundwater supplies. And um, as glaciers shrink, um, this is of deep, deep concern uh, to me and to many, many people. Um, so here we are. Um, this is an image from one of my books called Perpetual. And this work is by artist Cindy Mochizuki. Um, so reminding us that we're part of the hydrological cycle. Um, I'm roughly two thirds water, maybe a little bit more if you're younger or a little bit less if you're older. And that's thanks to the aquifer. So land is not as solid as I used to think. Land is groundwater, land is mycorrhizal mat, land is dirt and rock and more chemical surprises than I had first imagined. Underneath the concrete in the cities is earthy life, stony life, fluid life. Um, reading Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring, um, I learned that the ground, which I think is so solid, is actually home to a lot of water. Carson writes, groundwater is always on the move, sometimes at a pace so slow, uh, that it travels no more than 50 feet a year, sometimes rapidly by comparison, so that it moves nearly a tenth of a mile in a day. But mostly it contributes to streams and so to rivers, except for what streams, uh, what enters streams directly as rain or surface runoff, all of the running water of the earth's surface was at one time groundwater. And so in a very real and frightening sense, pollution of the groundwater is pollution of water everywhere. So the, the aquifers that we live on are large porous rocky surfaces on which we precariously conduct the noisy songs of our daily lives. Under the hum of highways and malls, the grace of groundwater quietly filters the toxins that seep down from our urban activities. If we organize our decision-making procedures and our economic models around the long-term health and well-being of these watersheds that we rely on, what kinds of futures can we create together? Um, and that is, I think, key for me in thinking about it. And this map that you're looking at now is a, um, a Vancouver, and I live along one of these little buried salmon streams. The red lines are where there used to be uh, salmon streams, over 50 of them in this area alone. And the blue lines are where they continue to exist. And so I happen to live near the corner of uh, St. George and Fifth, 
and um, you were asking about, um, you know, what's been our impact in terms of making the um, invisible visible. So in paying attention, uh, and I apologize, I'll, I'll start with the small scale uh, where I live, and then we can talk in Q&A and discussion about the bigger scale. Um, but uh, we've been, uh, what you, happens where I live is that you cannot see the water anymore because it's buried underground into culverts um, and sewers, but you can hear it. And um, the rain is still heavily flowing and you, um, can remember what was here before and perhaps what might come back if you work with it. So each day when I bike past the buried stream, I hear it gurgling. It's longing to return to daylight and moonlight to nurture ducks and bracken, ferns and salmonberry and you. Um, so this question of what do we learn by tracing flows of water? Um, how do we develop a, a participatory water ethic? And how might a shared need and respect for water offer common ground and common goals for different people? And these questions have taken me to places I would never otherwise go. <laughs> and I've learned from people I would never otherwise meet. Um, and one of the projects that I've done at home is um, we've painted a mural. This is a few years ago and the mural is no longer visible, but um, was uh, basically honoring the creek that flows under the ground there and is now a sewer and um, bringing in the kids to remember that history and to think about their relationship with water uh, in the neighborhood has been one of the most fun projects I've done over the many years that I've been working with water. So I, I just wanted to um, maybe close it with this slide and say that a baby is approximately three quarters water. A grandmother is approximately half water. When you bite into an orange, you're sinking your teeth into flesh that is four fifths water. So we're part of that hydrological cycle, not separate from it. Um, and when we think about water as relative rather than as a resource, um, our actions might shift as well. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Rita. That was just absolutely lovely. Um, you'll see there's many comments in the chat box, a uh, uh, great appreciation for your poem, which was beautiful, and uh, people asking where they can get a copy of it. Um, and some great, I, great thoughts and, and ideas as well. One that stood out for me is um, dealing with, uh, as a watershed council, we often talk about managing the water resource, and that's really not an accurate statement or phrase at all. We're really have to remind ourselves that it's really more about we're managing our impacts on water, which as you said, has its own self. <laughs> it's its own entity. It doesn't care what we, who we are or what we do, but um, it, that, that elevates the conversation uh, uh, beyond um, when we think about water management. Um, so very beautiful. Um, and, um, and I also liked your last comments on the daylighting. Um, we're going to come back to that. I've marked it down because there was actually a question from one of the registra registrants about daylighting streams that have been covered up uh, by, by urban growth. So, so thank you very much, Rita. That was absolutely lovely. Okay, we will move on. And I, I hope I get this right. Here I go. Api Sumuka, running coyote, William Singer III, is a member of the can I or get that can I Ghana nation yeah. of the Blackfoot Confederacy named after his great 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 uncle who was a Blackfoot warrior. Api Sumulka carries on his legacy through stewardship and maintaining the Blackfoot worldview. He's an artist and an illustrator with over 40 years of experience and his work is deeply rooted in Nitsitipi nits, nits history and using painting to teach. Along with his art, he devotes time to being an entrepreneur, an educator, a volunteer, and an environmental and political activist using Blackfoot ecological knowledge. Other areas of interest include food security and sovereignty, Blackfoot science, physics, watershed health, and grassland restoration. He's been involved in many spiritual, cultural events and activities, and has always been an advocate for First Nations rights, knowledge, and wellness. 
And I think with that, I'll let him tell you more about his work than, than I will. So welcome. Happy Sumaka. Uh, okay. Uh, and in English, it's running coyote, and I'm also known as William Singer III. And uh, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to share the history of uh, the work that uh, my community is doing and all the partnerships that are involved uh, with this work we're doing. It's uh, a new area for our tribe, but we're using our old, um, our old knowledge that still exists of processes. So I have a uh, PowerPoint um, I have here to tell the story. Uh, uh, so can you see that? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so thanks again. Uh, it's an honor to tell the story and uh, uh, so this is uh, looking out uh, my, well, my doorstep. And what I was gonna add was the title, making the invisible visible. But what you're looking at was a late up until um, early November, it dried up. So, you know, th there's a lot of uh, work that was really, depended on this on the water that it provided. But the other thing is that uh, the wildlife that is coming back there, they've got no place, no place to nest. So uh, the seven trumpeter swans that come, uh, come by here, they, yeah, they pass. Uh, so east of where I live and west of where I live, there's a series of lakes this size and they're all, they're all dried up. So, you know, the story I'm gonna talk about is it really, Water is really important because oh, he, he, that bad to be Water is like, you know, we can't do anything without water. And so in the uh, story I'll tell you is uh, the work that my community are doing to make this water come back, make it visible. So this is just another shot of the, uh, of the lake. And to the north are roughly about, um, I don't know, 400 maybe of uh, willow transplants, all the different uh, types of willows, they're all planted along there. And the project was a, a willow transplanting, um, well, project where we're gonna be using these willows to transplant in other areas. So this, this story, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, it involves a whole lot of things, but the, the thing that, you know, is really occurring is the disappearance of our plants. And a lot of the a lot of them we use in our our our, our, our processes and ceremonies we st we've done that we've done years you know thousands of years ago we still do them to this day. So and and we know the importance of water. So now that you know the question is you know uh, what's our next steps with this? And um, you know for the for the elders when they. When I talk to them, they, this is what they say. It is all here, the land, the plants, our ancestors and our future. One is held within the other. You cannot know the land without knowing the plants placed here by the creator. You cannot know the creator without knowing the plants. You cannot know the plants and their healing powers without hearing the stories. It is one and the same. So with that, water is connected to that. We can't see it at times. It's in water vapor. Then we can see large you know, water bodies of it. But that's our connection. And with, with us, that's our connection to our whole environment. No matter, you know, how we're always connected. Water is what connects us. So this is one of the teachings that I, I teach uh, preschool is Sibatsumo. Sweetgrass is one of those plants. It connects a lot of our prayers to, to the uh, spumita beaks or the sky beings. So this is something that is really also in peril of we're, we're, we're losing our sweetgrass or, or it grows wild. So this is a bed of sweetgrass that I grew last year and it uh, gave me seed, which I was really, you know, really uh, happy to see. You know? So working towards that, you know, there's always that connection, no matter where you go with water and it's always connected to the stars and up to the sky. So you're looking at water here, no matter every word clouds, the, the snow in the foreground, they're all connected. 
even in our stories, in the story of the Hitzikam or the Big Dipper, you can see all the different names of the stars. And one of them was, uh, his name was Bladder of Water. He had the power of rain. Okina had the power of oceans and lakes. And with them working together are the reason why we still see the remnants of what they did in the past, like this rock here, especially these cottonwoods. Of course, they're dying because there's no water. The riverbed has moved further and further north of these cottonwoods, so now they're starting to die. And these are very important trees in, in, our, in the neat stippy in our Blackfoot culture. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at, you know, so we're, we're beginning to adapt a lot of our protocols and our practices to begin to, you know, use like combine or use Western, you know, methods with our traditional methods. So there's a lot of that, a lot of it works and a lot of it doesn't. But what works is what, what, what we all share together is water. And that's something that, you know, because of the shortage of plants that are occurring in, on the reserve and in the Blackfoot territory area, uh, I developed the Napi's Garden and Tatuya Seed Bank. And this is basically growing plants for seed and, you know, just a cycle of that. And this putting them in the bank and just start growing some of them and just use, you know, teaching our, 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 our children now the preschool. And then when they graduate, these seeds will be there for them. Who knows how it's going to be in, in the next, uh, you know, 20 years. So you can see to the left of this photograph, this is in 2020, you can see part of the lake that uh, is visible there. And in the foreground, the uh, sort of yellowish uh, grass you see is a uh, leafy spurge. So that's something else I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, in the tribe or battling. So a lot of the work that uh, I, I do revolves teaching. So we all of the work that we do involves water. So we're, we're, I'm here teaching um, uh, high school. And this is a, 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 gar a greenhouse that I helped build over about 43 years ago when I was in residential school. This is the only thing that's still standing. And to come back to start growing our indigenous, you know, seeds, you know, was something that, well, for me, it was, it was really important because we're, you know, we're starting to use our, uh, use the land a lot more and understand it, you, you know, because the Blackfoot, the neat step, we were never, uh, we never planted, we never used our seeds. We used them for food and ceremonial purposes. But now we're beginning to, you know, start collecting seeds and getting the community involved and having them develop their own gardens and start growing their traditional seeds. And a lot of this is, this, it depends on water. So last year when we uh, planted uh, the willows, and uh, they, this is uh, last month, they took a picture and they, they're beginning to, they survived. So now it's just a matter of keeping them watered. And that in itself is, you know, quite a, uh, a task um, to do that. And which, you know, which led to this article with the Old Man Watershed Council, who I've, I've worked with, you know, partnered for quite a few, few years now, and we're doing uh, some really excellent work together. But this is, a lot of this is uh, restoring a lot of these practices we have in these plants, because we, a lot of, these are really connected to our whole worldview. So we've got, gone to that point where we're not, we're not only are we working to preserve our language to keep it going, but we're also having to do that with our plants. Because when we lose our plants, especially to climate change, and you know, we lose part of our language. So which is, you know, uh, this year, or oh, our theme for our Kipa Summit is Napi Uta Sapisa, which means the holder of sacred water. And in this picture is a, a, a draw image of Napi and the story of the flood. So this is a really important story I talk to the kids. So now the question is, you know, with, my, with the lake water body here, should I let nature take its course or should I just, you know, start, you know, trying to drill for water or something? So, you know, but so here at Napi's Garden, is, it's also the home of the kind of Ecosystem Protection Association. We do a lot of science work out here. So a lot of the work I began was basically citizen science. And, and a lot of the processes that we do are all based on science and physics. So and that's where a lot of the other work we're doing. So we're involved in uh, other members of the, our, our group are uh, 
uh, working on a trout project. Uh, there's also a mount, mountain project. There's this soil project. A lot of our you know communities. So we're adapting. We're adapting to these uh, uh, you know these Western methods where we're using them for you know combining them because you know for me you know we have to think about the future. You know, these are, are the kids that are going to be using these seeds to grow. They're going to be carrying on this new way that they've adapted. So with that, you know, the teachings go along the way. So a curriculum is being developed all based on water. So in the question is now, you know, what to do, you know. But for myself, there's always a way, you know, because, you know, when you start when you, when you put your mind to it and, and have people that you know are there to support you along the way and create these partnerships it's this is what keeps me going because you know the the bottom you know i guess one of the for the logo of uh that you know in here the opokas and the, it's just left uh to the right of my dog zoro those are are, are the what are important those are their future their preschool so this is where a lot of of the work and the understanding of water and what makes water grow plants and plants are what we survive on and plants are our connection to the land and to everything into the cosmos. Now we need to strengthen that connection even more by conserving water and this is the other thing too for myself I get my water trucked in. So I, I don't have that opportunity to be able to just you know use my water to this, you know, recreationally or anything I have to really conserve my water. So, you know, so getting in my ends too, uh, and that's how it is. And I just want to thank you again. I, you know, I haven't been able to, this, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg of the, the work that is being done here on my community. So, uh, yeah, so uh, any questions, feel free. And thank, thanks again for listening. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Um, I'll never look at the Big Dipper again the same way. <laughs> I grew up in Northern Alberta and the Big Dipper is my guide, uh, but I didn't know it had a connection to water. So that's really interesting. Um, and you also made me really think about, you know, often, again, as water managers, we're, we think in sort of a, a 10 or 20, maybe 50 year timeline, but you reminded me of the long-standing relationship between water and plants and indigenous people, and that our time frame when we're trying to understand those relationships must be much, much larger, much longer. Um, I'm just wondering, Shannon, did you want to jump in and say a few words? I see your 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 video is on. Oh sure. Um, well, Apisimaka is very humble and he's sharing a part of his story, but um, I, I just wanna thank him and acknowledge that he's a very important teacher and um, artist and uh, steward of the land. And um, we've been really honored to work with you on, on your, your land and on, on the planting the willows and the native seeds. So, um, you know, that's a quick snapshot of some of the work that, that he's doing, but it's actually so much more and it's really touched a lot of people and educated a lot of people and engaged a lot of youth and, and Western scientists that are opening their eyes to the indigenous worldview. So um, thank you for sharing a bit of that with us today. Really appreciate it. Okay, um, so this portion, next portion of our our session is if all three speakers could um, put their video and their sound on, and we'll share some of the questions that were submitted by their registrants. And uh, okay. So the first question sort of builds, I think all three of you touched on sort of this concept of making the invisible visible and how it resonates with you. Um, but maybe we could dive into that just a little bit more, you know, um, what maybe, so what are the opportunities around making the invisible visible? I think Brian, you talked a little bit about, you know, demystifying groundwater 
um, understanding its complexity. But but where do you what do you think here in Alberta um, would be a good next step for sort of thinking about that concept, making the invisible visible, and and just how does that how does it resonate with you a little bit more? Sure. Um... Well, I mean, it, I think events like this are an excellent place to start. We have different perspectives brought, well, different, but the same, just different language, maybe um, perspectives brought around around this issue and hearing more, hearing more about it. Um, I think fundamentally, it's, it's just, it's just talking more about it, talking more about what we know, what we don't know, how things are connected. Um, you know, building on this idea that the place tells the story, I loved hearing that and the fact and the constant reminder that we are water and we are part of it all. So just being involved in more conversation, um, regardless of, of what you're doing and where you're at is, is an excellent place to start. Rita? Um. I was really struck by um, something that Api Sumakta said, which was that, you know, um, to not have the luxury of recreation with water because it is so um, uh, precarious or, or um, tight, I guess. And it was a really good reminder um, and that, uh, you know, to, to really pay attention to the water um, and how our lives depend on it. So in terms of making things visible, like I, um, my friend Dorothy talks about water having a spirit and um, being in relationship with the water. And so to respect that, I think, and to talk about that is a way of making that visible, I think. Interesting. And to hear the language also is really important. The, um, it was really good to hear some of the language that I think comes from the land and the people of the land. Mm -hmm. Api Simaka? Yeah, uh, so, um, well, there's a couple of things that, you know, yeah, so for myself, like I've all, I, when I was growing up, I was surrounded by water. There was uh, uh, wells all around, this is what filled my lake up. And so now, uh, you know, I had a wild dog when I had my house built. So I've been out here for close to 12 years. And the first uh, year I was living out here, the well ran dry. So they took a second well. So now the, I don't know how far the, the, what the groundwater has gotten down, but so it's, it's gonna be a challenge because one of the things that I've been, I was discussing with my older uh, brother about uh, the lake because it's um, really important is, uh, you know, perhaps drilling one of these uh, well sites. So, and also the other thing too, is that we, in our, our um, well, you know, within, within our, our, our communities, we have, um, there's these ceremonies that they have for like for water. So, and those are things that, you know, um, you know, we, we do, they're part of our prayers. And so for, for what we're doing, uh, the work out here is, you know, we're just going to have to figure out uh, something, but still carry on, like, because, you know, like being uh, water, you know, have the means to haul water. So now that's going to be the, you know, the situation for now, because the last time this lake was, in, was dried up, dry was back in 1984. And it took about two years and it filled up again. So, um, you know, I, I don't know the situation with that now, if it'll ever fill back up with water. So yeah, and, and with the garden work that we're doing, it's it was really important to the work we're doing. You know, like, but I still acknowledge it as a, a water body, you know. So I walked down there this morning and like, I still acknowledge it as a water body. You know, I, I hope that it will come back. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all of you sort of touched on that you had some time in your life or some event in your life that that connected you with water um, or that inspired the work that you're currently doing. Do you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of a key event in your life that that connected you with water? And maybe this time we'll start with Rita. Um, sure. I, I, there's one more thing I meant to say on the last question in terms of making the invisible visible. And part of that is the value. Like, I, I think um, 
um, a piece story makes it very clear the importance and the crucialness of the water. But the um, one of the things I've been involved with a number of years now is opposition to the Site C Dam and because of the effects it would have on the water up in Northern BC, as well as downstream into Alberta. Um, and I think if people understood the value of water, the, the value of natural ecosystems, like you can, I think the David Suzuki Foundation and other, maybe Pam, but I'm not sure, other groups have done sort of, um, you know, attempts to uh, monetize or uh, evaluate the, the, the ecosystem benefits that are provided in a natural ecosystem. But I think those things are undervalued and underseen. And if we absolutely understood that value, we would be making very different decisions. So I think that is also part of making visible the invisible, the, the kinds of value that are taken for granted or underestimated. We, when they shift as they do suddenly or over time, we recognize how valuable they are. And so like um, each summer for the last five to seven years, I've been going up to the Peace Valley and just witnessing what's happening up there. Um, a lot of people in the south of the province don't necessarily know or pay attention, but there's clear cutting happening that's the length of basically over 100 kilometers of, of fertile river valley. And I don't think that, you know, you can get that back. So, or it will take many hundreds or thousands of years for nature to heal, right? Or hundreds anyway. I have learned from paying attention up north and down here as well, that nature heals herself and that land heals itself if you work with the land, but you have to stop um, the violence on the land. You have to stop interfering with what it's trying to do so that it can heal. Um, and so that's been a big lesson for me in, in the work that I've done, just following the rivers, whether that's the Fraser River or the Peace River or the Columbia River. Like there's a lot to learn just from paying attention to what the water does of, of, of its own accord. Okay. Um, Brian or Apisuaka, do you want to um, answer a little bit more about any, you know, major life events that led you to your connection with water? I think you've kind of touched on them, but. Go ahead, Api. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things uh, for me, it was, uh, um, I grew up with, uh, without running water. And uh, so uh, me and my older brother, we would have, we walked close to about uh, a mile to get water. We'd have buckets and we did that almost every other day. Uh, and to me, that was just normal. Um, and then every once in a while we'd visit some of our relatives and <clears throat> luxury of running water and inside toilet, bathroom. But the thing it was, was this lake. I grew up out here uh, and it's always been here. And, and I know a lot about it. That, so for me, it's always something that, you know, I see every day when I was a kid, even now when I walk out the door, you, that's the first thing you see. And that's what's really, you know, makes it really uh, challenging now, you know, with the, the work that I'm, that's, gonna, that's going on out here. You know, there's, this, there's gonna be a greenhouse built. Uh, so a lot of the cultivation that, it, that it, it was occurring around my house is slowly getting turned back to grassland. So, and that's, you know, with the, with the partnerships that I have, and one of them was with OWC. So it's, that's for me, you know, and, and that's also connected to the land. So when the water, when my lake was still here, roughly about that, six or seven years ago, I, I decided to, to heal the land. I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work and, you know, fix you. I'll see whatever I can do. Because at that time, I thought the water, the lake would be there. But now it's working to heal, heal the lake now, you know, to see what can be done. Uh, so, and the thing too is there's, you know, we're in the midst of figuring out what, what we're going to do, the future of this place. I believe that we can succeed with what we're doing, but you know, it's just the water issue. You know, I don't want this place to turn into a desert, you know, and, but I believe in the work that we're doing that we'll, we will succeed. It's just, you know, like I said, doing, letting nature take its course, wait a few years for it to come back or just start, hopefully you can open up one of our wilds and just fill it back up, which was the case in the past. So yeah, that's a, 
but for me, I, you know, it's it's the other thing now. I'm, you know, the land, and I'm saving the water too. So <laughs> they, go, they go both hand in hand. You know? mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Brian, did you want to add anything? Um, sure. I think one of the manifestations, I guess, we see about groundwater are springs, and you know, I think back to the first time I would have seen a spring with my grandfather and you know even now when I'm out working and you know showing students and, and taking other people to look at springs it's just it's a it's that part where you get a chance to connect with with the here and now but it's also connection to the past as well because I think these spring systems are responding to you know recent time but also longer time and so um, I guess what I mean by that is sometimes you see a spring dry up and it doesn't flow anymore and you can start to ask why and think about well, what happened to cause that. Um, or you see springs in the middle of a desert where you wonder why they're there to begin with in the first place. And it's just, you know, connecting with that and seeing the, you know, your place in your place in the physical sense, but then also your spot in the sort of temporal sense in the time, the time series that's there. And a few years back, we took a small group out to um, Elk Island Park, just sort of east of Edmonton here, and looked at some springs that have been there for, for quite some time. And um, the year we happened to visit was very hot, very dry. Most of Western Canada was very smoky. You know, the springs were still there, but they were crusty. You know, they were starting to, to look drier. And, and they'll still be there again this year, and they'll still be there again, hopefully, the years, years to come but they change as well, right? So it's almost then sort of connecting with, with what's happening in, in space and time, um, which I don't know, it's kind of a constant reminder and, and a connection that, uh, that we can have with, with waters. I, I know, I think it's maybe uh, Alberta Geological Society, but I believe we have a, a spring inventory website in Alberta, where if you find a spring, um, you can send the data so that we can map and know where these springs are. Um, the is next one. Sorry. Sorry. Is, is there a link to that? I would love to know where those springs are. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'll I'll, I'll see if Ashley can dig it up, but I, it might be, like I say, on the AER AGS. Oh, there, somebody just put it up. That's the great thing about Thank a you. participatory audience. <laughs> Um, so we sort of, you know, look back at, at in the past as what influenced you and what connected you to your work. And the next question is looking more into the future. Where do you see your work and your relationship with water going in the next decade or so? And are there major things like climate change that will impact that work? It doesn't have to be climate change. Maybe it's just um, science or growth or culture. Um, so what do you see as your work and your relationship with water going in the next 10 years? And maybe, um, I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> Brian, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, yeah, well, I think like I mentioned, yeah, maybe in the sort of introductory materials, I, I, it's this idea of time and kind of looking at the time frames of how water is moving around in these different places are, I guess, our role in that. And then looking forward, then what, as we choose, we, society chooses to different, do different things in, in the watersheds, what could happen? And, and starting to look at almost scenarios of what could happen, um, you know, in the next 10 years. So I guess where I'm starting to work more and more is trying to take some of that, um, sort of take the science parts that, that we do but then mesh it with with others right because it, it's other folks that have the questions and have the interest as well and, and that's where i think you know a lot of the gains can can be made um so yeah i think continuing to look at, at kind of the, the time frame of, of what's happening and then that can help maybe look at what change you know as we start to talk about change what we could expect to see um that's probably will keep me busy for hopefully the next <laughs> 10 years or so. <laughs> that sounds like it probably involves some modeling and 
and trying to predict the future. Well, yeah, that's a that's kind of a dangerous game, but <laughs> at least looking at at possibilities, let's say. Okay. And then right. you know, thinking about the possibilities, planning for it, working more and more with students that do some of the some of the brilliant modeling, uh, less so with myself these days, but and, and letting them and that, and actually in that regard, then they get a chance to discover what you know where could this go and what, what could this look like in a different scenario, and, um, and kind of test it out. Nice. Rita, where do you see your work going in the next 10 years? Oh, um, just a quick note about that um, neighborhood art project that I showed you. That street that was um, done with the mural is going to stop. It's They're going to be removing the pavement and turning it into a green space over the next um, couple of years. Um, the project was written into the city of Vancouver's capital plan. It took an inordinate amount of effort on a part of a lot of people besides me to get that to happen. So on a local level, there's a like a we've created this idea of a rainway. So to celebrate the rain, to hold the rain in the earth, to work with it, to bring back the plants and the animals, because when you slow down water, you make the conditions for life. Um, that's on a small scale, something that I'm happy to see happening in my day to day life. Um, on the larger scale, though, um, I've been also very supportive of uh, uh, stopping the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, um, not because of any sort of, um, like I understand that we're reliant on oil, but I also understand that we're in a climate crisis and we need to get off oil. So I, I think that what I would like to see in the next 10 years and further is a transition off of fossil fuels uh, that is more into renewable energy and really works with the waterways that we need to be healthy. So that's my hope. Uh, obviously, it's uh, hard to say what's going to happen, and it's been quite a tough struggle. Um, and I always say that my love uh, for Alberta is actually what keeps me going in it, as well as my love for BC. Like, I don't buy that sort of divisive fight between BC and Alberta on this issue. I think the issue is water and we need to really focus on the water. So that's that's kind of where I land on that. Um, and it's a hard conversation to have sometimes, I know. Um, so groups like Iron and Earth that are doing work to get off of oil and into renewable energies, I'm really uh, excited to see their work uh, in Alberta. Um, I'm also uh, thinking that there's a lot of work to be done in working in partnership with Indigenous peoples like this crisis is nothing new. This crisis has been unfolding since colonization hit this land. And just listening to Api talk about, you know, having water trucked in, having to carry water as a kid, like that crisis has been here. And so, I, um, you know, there's a lot to learn uh, from working with indigenous leadership and, and trying to really restore the plants, the animals, the waterways, um, I think that that's a lifelong and many generational uh, endeavor that we uh, are hopefully embarking on. That's my hope. Thanks, Rita. Api Sumaka, you would, where do you see your work going in the next 10 years? You're going to be busy planting and collecting seeds. And <laughs> yeah, well, it, in the meantime, is this the working on getting the issue of water back out here? which means I'm gonna to have to use even more or less than I use now. So, um, but with that, you know, the good, good thing about that too as well, the indigenous plants that I'm, you know, that grow and I'm also planting out here, they don't need that much water, you know? So, and that's something that, you know, you know in the long term, that's what we're moving towards is to start cultivating a lot of these indigenous plants like our wild turnips, wild onions, wild carrots, a lot of our shrubs and fruits and uh, fruit berries, all of those, so we're we're moving into you know this, uh, well actually decolonizing or de uh, indigenizing. Um, that's a quote from my friend Mariah Gladstone. So uh, indigenizing the diet. And one of the important, the most important things out of that of that is water, and that's you know to drink a lot of water. So, but. For me, that's the that's the other thing I'll be working on is also saving the water out here. Hope, hope you know, finding ways to bring it back because it's it's important. You know, it's a part of uh, like like water wells. They're like 
animals or species are they, they, they're becoming extinct and that's how everything is so that's my my goal you know but you know i always see the good thing from it that you know it's there's always you know for me it's research there's always an opportunity to learn and to share knowledge and work with others Okay, well, maybe we'll drill down a little bit more into a little bit more of a technical question. Um, and you, but all, well, all of you have sort of touched on it in a way. And many of the people on the call today, you know, working in watershed councils, many of us work to restore small tributary streams. Often they're, you know, fish bearing, especially our cold water streams in the East Slopes. Um, and we really have learned a lot in the last 10 years about the interaction between small streams and shallow groundwater. And um, I know there's a lot more technical words for, for this zone between shallow groundwater and, and uh, surface water. And, and maybe that's something that's going on with, the, with Appy's Lake. Um, and also Rita talking about streams that get covered over, salmon streams that get covered over with uh, uh, urban urbanization. So just thinking about, you know, how important those areas are, um, you know, their recharge and discharge between surface water and groundwater. What can we do better to protect those areas? First of all, Brian, if you can tell us a little bit how important those areas are, and then how do we protect those better? We're, we're good at protecting sort of surface water, but we, I don't know if we're doing a good job of protecting the connection with that shallow groundwater. Um, yeah, sure. So I, I, the boring technical term would be hyperreic zone. Um, Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, this is a, as you, as you mentioned, it is that, that sort of interface right where even just in centimeter scale, very, very short distances, right at the bed of a creek, um, you know, the base of some of these small creeks where you have, you know, water, groundwater, or water, let's, let's just call it water, moving in, in the river, out of the river, into the ground, back and forth and back and forth, and creating these, these really sort of microcosmic, perfect conditions for, uh, for fish spawning, right, for certain vegetal, you know, vegetation growth, for, you know, just creating kind of the right environment for, for those sorts of things. Um, one of the things would just be to understand where they, you know, where they are, what, what, to what extent do we see that in a lot of these creeks that, that are coming off the, well, they're everywhere really, but you know, where are they important? Where do we have observations that, um, you know, that trout might like to, to, to be in those areas and, and linking, you know, linking the sort of hydrology part of it to, to some of the other pieces that, uh, that are really important, right. That drive it in terms of what to do that, you know, that's where my mind goes first is just you know, where do we see them on a map almost like the springs inventory that we saw come by in the chat it's just like where are these really critical reaches of these creeks and rivers that uh, that folks know about and and you know people that live in the area that are on the land that that, that see it would would have would have fantastic knowledge of that now, much like the, the creeks and the, they're much like the springs, though, not everyone wants to put their hand up and say, oh, I have a beautiful spring in my backyard, right? So there is, there is a, a sensitivity around that, which needs to be respected as well. Um, so it's, it's finding the right time to share and the right way, the right way to do that. Yeah, knowledge is everything. We have to know where groundwater is. We have to know where springs are. We need to know where the hyperreic zone <laughs> is important um, before we can protect it and, and make sure that it's taken care of. Uh, Rita or, or Api Sumaka, did you wanna add anything sort of about that in those important areas of interaction between surface water and groundwater? Maybe just to think about a sponge. Like I, I had an engineer once explain to me why, um, <laughs> why we want to slow down the water and hold it in the earth as opposed to just running it off into the ocean immediately. Um, and, you know, like having little demonstrations or, or things for lay people who don't necessarily know what's under the ground, I think is a useful thing to do. Um, and yeah, just having stories and, and sharing stories is so important and talking about it is so important, I think. Um, ceremony too, I think is also important to honor What's underneath? Yeah. 
you know, and another aspect of that, of course, is the relationship between uh, water and soil as well. And I have to admit, watershed councils, we don't talk about soil a lot, but obviously water and soil are a whole nother realm of management that we need to understand. Happy, were you gonna jump, jump in there? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, one of the other things that, um, oh, oh, that's happening here on the, uh, the reserve is the uh, they're having this Kiskstaki uh, uh, or beaver project. So they're going to be reintroducing, re, re, reintroducing some beaver uh, in certain parts of the reserve. So where I live, there's uh, about a half mile from here is the bullhorn coulee. So, um, and that uh, connects into uh, the belly and it connects into the old man. So, um, but you know, to, um, so one of the things I learned out here was that it, like the, um, like the groundwater and and when it, even when it started so with when this lake started to drop back and run about 2012 that's when i started noticing uh my water intermittently start have you know um so finally it, it, when it got to a certain level then and that's when my water dried up so we're you know I, well it's just finding uh yeah just we're finding different ways even through like uh, other well beavers to help because they're really good at what they do they're the ones that really engineer a lot of the the places that are on water they're like buffalo you know the in or you know the bison so they're really integral so those are the things that we're also using you know like so sort of like we're approaching it from more of a neat steppy or blackfoot science perspective mm -hmm. and a lot of that includes um you know, with water, it has its own songs, uh, and it has its ceremonies, and those are things that you you don't normally just you have to have a, a really really good reason to sing those songs to ask them for what you need. So those are things that you know, um, you know, we we have had discussions with elders. So and a lot of it is you know we it's what I call Blackfoot science. So, but that it's just understanding that because a lot of the elders that I work with um, need, you know, I've been having to explain what uh, climate change is, you know, why is your, you know, why did your water disappear? So it's just also just to be educating a lot of our community because this is such a uh, different, uh, yeah, perspective or I don't know, adaptation for the, for, for the community. But for me, it's just trying to hang on to, whatever water is left, because I know there's water under there, it's just getting it back. Um, okay, the next one is, um, how can we as a community better understand groundwater ourselves and also better communicate our understanding to others? So again, it goes beyond, you know, as scientists, we, we learn a lot of information, but we're maybe not so great at sharing it. <laughs> uh, but uh, Brian, you, you were saying that, you know, in your life, your phase of your career, you're looking more at how do you share information now? So any thoughts on how, how as a community do we better understand groundwater and how do we better communicate our understanding with others? Um, yeah, well, I think it, it's, probably more on the, on the latter, just in terms of the communication aspect. It, we can, there are lots of, well, there are some people, I guess, that have, you know, gone through sort of Western science training to learn about this perhaps as I have, but it's in that communication side of things where you really start to hear more about how, how it all fits together. Um, yeah, how to do that is a great question, actually. <laughs> and I, I, <laughs> don't have a fantastic answer except for participating in events and saying you know saying yes when something outside of the sphere of of the day-to-day -day work comes in and uh, is to try to say yes just to be involved and and see where it takes you because it, it could be a fantastic surprise to be honest thank you uh rita um, I taught a course uh called contemplating water a number of years ago and I've taught different versions of it um, we haven't had a, that big a focus on groundwater, but I've had, um, for example, students document, you know, a day in their life with water. And it would be interesting to do that with groundwater, actually, and see what people come up with. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, like, uh, for example, there was one student who um, just went without water for a day and you appreciate it a lot more when you don't have it for a day, right? Uh, or longer, um, you know, so doing experiments or things like that and just being attentive to what you learn through doing them um, is, is one way. Um, and a friend of mine who's from Japan was saying that there's a very popular um, thing where people, there's like a hundred water spots in Japan and you can visit like the best drinking water, spring water. And like people actually go and look these places up and there's sort of like a bit of a touristy thing around it, you know, like a, a pilgrimage of sorts. Um, I'm not sure that that's something that would fly here, but I think it's an interesting idea to value and celebrate those places, because I know when I've drunk spring water, I've just felt so incredibly grateful, you know, to just be able to drink that water straight from the earth like that is, is really an amazing experience and one that uh, should be common as opposed to unusual. Interesting. Afi Sumaka, anything to add on? Yeah, so, uh... Yeah, so water is a, 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 a big issue, not just for myself, but for my community. Uh, so a lot of the homes have their, I think three quarter of the homes have, have, their, have to have their water trucked. And in the communities, they have whatever water they come, they get either from the river or their aquifer. Uh, everyone, yeah, every few months there, we have boil water warnings. So, and, and that really affects a lot of the, what we're working on because we're, you know, we're working towards, um, you know, changing our, our diets by growing, by having these uh, community gardens and, you know, and access to water is a huge issue. So, and even for uh, houses and people that want to individually have gardens. And so, and this has been going on for years and years, you know, on the reserve is how to get more access to water because uh, across, uh, across the road, um, in the town of Cardston, they have running clean running water, all the amenities, but across the way, it's, yeah, so, um, and those are things that we, we, you know, so water is really important. So it's to the point where we, we're using it for ourselves more, you know, than to, like, for, yeah, to have a garden or to have a, a pool, you know, things like that. It's, it's really precious. That's where that, uh, you know, that water carrier not be, you know, you, you know, up that, beside. that means you carry water. So it's not only that, but it's also in your mind too, as well. Always finding ways to, to preserve that. But with us, that's the challenge that we're, we're facing. And it's just figuring out ways because we have such a large reserve and I believe we only have four water trucks. Now, when I run out of water, it takes them about, up to about a week or a week and a half to get my water. So yeah, so it's just, you know, there's, it's such an important thing to, to us. It's, it's there. It's just getting, you know, getting it. It seems to just flow all around us. <laughs> no, it's just having more access to it. Because we all share the same thing. Because for me, you know, yeah, my, my community were, were, you know, we were going through a lot of these different crises. But for our, our neighbors and, you know, our allies, we're all in this together. You know, we're all in this together. We're all affected. So that's. Happy, I, I, don't go away because I was pleased to see in your slides that you work with youth. And the next question is around how do we get youth more engaged in in watershed uh, management and understanding water and and working to improve our water. So how do how do we get youth more engaged? Mm -hmm. How do we get youth more engaged oh, yeah. in water work? Uh, well, one of the things that uh, I, I, I use in my teachings with um, the uh, preschool, and it's called the Apukatsin. Apukatsin means all children, early intervention society. So I'm working with three, three four-year-olds up to about six-year-olds. And so uh, a lot of that involves our language. But so uh, uh, the, in addition to that uh, is the teachings of the land what we call learning from the land. So we're, we're adding that onto that. And all of those teachings, the main part of all of that is water. So, you know, it takes water to grow, you know, plants. It takes us to live, but we're, you know, a, a, a large percentage of us is water. 
So, and, and that's the other thing too, is uh, also teaching them that we're in climate change and there may be challenges to have access to water. And that's where, you know, uh, aside from, you know, even though they, they may come from, you know, uh, living in the city and they have uh, uh, good access to water, but it's also to, for them to understand that, you know, we're, we're in such a precarious time now where, you know, where things just disappear really quick. You know, we, we thought it'll take about maybe 10, 15 years, but within two or three years, things are disappearing. So everything with that, you know, teaching them water, water, because one of the things is that's their future. That's something that they, they're going to have to, you know, carry on. And we're basically giving them the seeds to do that. And I really hope, you know, they have water in the future. Hopefully we're in about 20 years or so, they'll have uh, a good access to water because that's the whole, the, well, the work that I do. So, you know, it's, instead of just showing someone to plant a seed, but they're being taught what that seed can do. That seed is a food, that seed has science and technology behind it. Even everything down to our fruits and berries, everything has a science and technology to it has so many teachings to it. And that's what's going along with this. So there's so much that for me, I it sort of just once say, you know, I stumbled upon, but I began the realization that we're in this new time. We're adapting even further than we have, you know, because we're still here, but now we're gonna have to start teaching our children how to be in uh, order culturalists, just like Dakota, the Sioux, the Cherokee. So now we're gonna be joining them. Nice. Those, those are good comments that it's it's their future. That's a good reason to get involved. <laughs> Rita, did you want to weigh in? Sure. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I think creative projects or like that community mural, for example, are, are a good way to get people involved. But I, I think that thinking about the, um, you know, in BC, we've seen floods, fires, heat dome, all of this in one year. And there's a lot of grief and a lot of I think distress and anxiety around how quickly the climate is changing. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Like those reason, those those feelings are reasonable and and logical to feel right now. Um, at the same time, I would say that for me, hope isn't the sense that things are going to get better. Like I don't know if they will or not, but hope is the sense that it's worth doing these things to heal the land and ourselves, regardless of what the outcome is. Like hope is is grounded, I think, in that sense of unconditional love or care for one another, not necessarily in sort of some instrumental outcome that may or may not happen. Um, and so I think that, you know, to continue to stay connected, to do things together, whether that's growing food, you know, going for plant walks, doing art, whatever it happens to be where you are, I think those things that nourish our spirits are really important to keep doing. Um, and to keep talking and learning the songs, you know, learning to sing gratitude songs for the water and for each other, I think is, is a good way to be in this time. So like, I, I also wanted to acknowledge earlier in that question, um, the Tsleil-Waututh have been healing the land here. So the land was, the water was too poisoned, but clams have been coming back. The orca whales have been coming back. Like there's a lot, as I said, that nature can do when we work with nature. And so, there's a lot of learning there that uh, is so uh, powerful to become part of and to learn and uh, support. So bringing kids out to events, you know, to music festivals, to the ceremonies at the inlet, um, to all kinds of things. So the Squamish were successful in stopping a clear cut in an area north of here where there's old growth forest. So bringing children to the forest, right, is, is so important. Spending time with the water because that's what gives you the energy and the strength is that connection with the larger um, force or energy that is this earth, right? There is something more powerful than economies and that's life. <laughs> and so like whatever we can do to keep our kids connected to that is really important. Thank you. Okay, Brian, did you wanna say anything about youth? And then I promise there'll just be one more question after that. <laughs> Sure. I think just just building on uh, what Rita was saying is is just you know asking kids where things come from. They often are my kids don't tend to think about that kind of thing all the time. But where does your water come from? You know, when you bite in, and I love the example of that orange. You know, when you bite into the orange, well, where where did that come from? And it's not meant to be 
an accusatory kind of question or any, any sort of judgment. It's just connecting, mm -hmm. connecting back to where, where our foods come from, where our, our beverages come from, all that sort of thing. And, you know, slowly it, it would take time, but you start to understand then that some things come from, you know, our, our backyard has lots of things that we can eat from it. Some things come from a bit farther away. Some things unfortunately can come from a really, really long way away. And, you know, just acknowledging that that, that exists and that happens. And, um, you know, we're then, are we sharing that water when you buy, you know, strawberries in the middle of February that are grown in California or something like that? Um, that's, that's, that's a good, a good thing to be exposed to and start to, to learn about it. It sort of plants an early seed, at least in, in, the, you know, someone that becomes more of a scientist down the road to, to think about water, just, it's always going to be here, right? And our planet is, is defined by water and it's everywhere and it's all around this globe Even, and it's, it's constantly changing. So that cycle and that sort of ebb and flow that exists it's unfortunate when we <clears throat> when we don't see it, you know, where we want to see it, such as 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 Appy's Lake and in, in on his property on the property there on on the land. But where did it where did it go? And it doesn't it disappears from one place, but it goes to some other place. And so as as we talk about climate change and we start to think about what that could be, it's just it's it's changing. You get floods and then droughts and then things happening, and it's a lot to wrap your head around, you know, why and where. Um, but it doesn't just disappear completely. It's just gone somewhere else. And, and I think I'm understanding that. So asking, you know, where does that water come from in the tap uh, is, is a great place to start too. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like visit the reservoir if there is one, you know, where you live and, and also where the wastewater treatment plants are. Super interesting to visit the wastewater treatment plants. Really stinky, but it teaches you a lot. Well, that's true. And, and it's part of our existence. So, okay. I promise. Thank you. I know it's been a long time, but I'm going to let you close with just one last question and just remind me. Can I say something? Um, okay. Yes. Uh, can, you, can you see me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to share something. Um, I, I'm not sure that we can we can sort of see that, I guess. The topic, this is uh, the Oldman River meets Bow River to make the South Saskatchewan. Okay. Yeah, so the topic is, as you said, to communicate, to help people to to care on water. So yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm living in Calgary, a retired oil gas engineer. Yeah. So I'd like to spend several years later um, just to focus on the rivers. Mm -hmm. One by one, from Mucca River to, to the Old Man, and then one by one, I, I, I fly the drones. So, oh. okay. well, so I made a lot of a video to show my, my friends. For example, that I dig out a lot of, lot of story, the historical story behind Mucca River and the, and the Canada and the US relations, something like that. So help people to understand the water, understand the river and they love them. The people just care what they love, right? Right, right. Yeah. Thank so you. As a volunteer, so I, I, I have my friend, we, we do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, sorry, but I've got to cut you off and, and start to wrap things up. But yeah, you know, it's so great in this day and age that we live in that there are so many more visuals than maybe we had when we, you know, a few decades ago. So drones and videos and, and YouTube are great ways to help sp spread the water message. I want to just quickly wrap up, though, and just say remind you today that we do have a number of elected officials. We've got lots of water managers. We had the 11 watershed uh, councils all listening in. So if there's one thing you wanted to tell everybody that they should go and do, uh, you know, to improve groundwater management and to make the invisible visible, what would that one last thing be that you want to tell all the rest of us? So I'm not sure who wants to start with that. Maybe Rita, one last thing you want to tell all of the audience today. Um, that's a hard question. Oh, sorry. I would say uh, put the health of the water first and work with Indigenous peoples to care for the water. Perfect. That's awesome. Thank you. Brian? Um, go observe something. 
Okay. Feed. And if you need to, share it. <laughs> Great. And Appy, last last word. What's your yeah, um, it would be uh, and that means to respect to respect the environment and, and that's our water. So it's to respect our water. Thank you very much. Those are all awesome words of wisdom. Thank you for sharing that with all of us. And thank you for everything today, your presentations, your wise words and, and participating in this discussion. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And I can see from the comments in the share in, in the chat that everybody else really enjoyed it as well. Um, I'm going to uh, quickly wrap up because I think we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, so one thing I did want to do is um, just remind everybody that every World Water Day, the UN releases a report on World Water Day um, with uh, advice and information about the theme for this year. So there, if you go to the United Nations World Water Day, there will be a report on groundwater and, and it'll have some policy advice and recommendations in there. Um, I really encourage everybody to go and, and at least read the executive summary. I think it's really useful to, um, you know, look at groundwater from an international whole world situation and see what people are dealing with and then bring that knowledge back to Alberta and, and maybe it'll give you a fresh look at the way we're managing things in Alberta today. Um, so I think that's really useful. And I encourage, uh, what I'll do is I encourage all of you to have uh, a last word. So the same question, if there's one thing that you wanted to tell all of the audience today, feel, please feel free in the chat to, um, to write in the chat what, what one thing is that you think we can do to improve uh, groundwater management in Alberta and making the invisible visible. And while you write that in the chat box, any last comments, uh, I believe that we have a door prize. And so I'm going to ask uh, Elisa to announce who won the door prize today. Hi, yes. I think uh, Kendra was going or to- Kendra, be sorry. Yeah, so I, I drew a name and I think they didn't quite make it here to the end, but they were in here earlier and it was Shannon Woods. So I don't believe she's still in here, but I we will be reaching out to her anyways. Okay, great. She was in here earlier, I double checked. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, and I hope again that you're putting your, your piece of advice or your last comment into the chat box. You've got 11 watershed councils here ready and able to listen to your advice as to what we should be doing around groundwater. So I hope you're typing away. Um, but while you do that, I will just, again, thank everybody for participating today. Um, thank you to Dr. Brian Smearden, Dr. Rita Wong, and Api Sumaka for their great and thought-provoking presentations. Um, I think we're all going away with lots in our head uh, swirling around and, and making us rethink how we're thinking about groundwater and other water management issues. Thank all of you who attended today. Thanks, uh, it's great to have a great audience. Um, thank you to all of Alberta, the 11 WPACs, the Watershed Planning and Advisory Councils that are here today. And in particular, within the 11 Watershed Councils, we have an education and outreach committee with staff from all 11 uh, WPACs. So thank you to that education and outreach committee for organizing this and putting it all together. It was a great job, uh, well done. And of course, um, I want to thank everybody that supports the work of Alberta's 11 WPACs. Um, we wouldn't be here without all of the funders, supporters, volunteers. We all have uh, boards that are run by volunteers. We have committees run by volunteers. And we even get volunteers out there to uh, plant willows from time to time and other things. Um, I've also been asked to thank the Eco Action Community Funding Program, which helped, helped with some of this work. So again, one last time, thank you to everybody for participating today and happy World Water Day. And with that, I think I'll let everybody go. Thank you very much, everybody. Well done. Thanks, Petra. Is there any